Well, young lady, what's your name? Susan Walker, what's yours? She was camera ready from the time that she was a child. Mommy! She grew up gracefully on screen. She was the number one glamour girl. Man, do you look wild. Thank you. But Natalie Wood paid a high price for her success. Natalie had a quality that made you want things to turn out well for her in the end. I'm moving. Maybe up, maybe down. But wherever it is, I'm enjoying it. Do you know what the imagination is? Oh, sure. That's when you see things, but they're not really there. She began as a scene-stealing child star. Uh -oh. She grew into a sexy ingenue. I love you, Jim. But in a career that spanned four decades and over 50 films, Natalie Wood became much more an icon of Hollywood glamour, beauty, and heartbreak. She was so intelligent and had so much inside her. There is so much to tell about her. Natalie Wood was born Natalia Nikolaevna Zakarenko on July 20th, 1938 in San Francisco. She was nicknamed Natasha by her parents Nick and Maria, who were poor Russian immigrants. After Natasha's birth, her father changed the family name from Zakarenko to Gurdon. He was tired of being called last for everything. My father was a little stereotypical, melancholy Russian, and my mother was quite the opposite. My mother was extremely outgoing and just thought that Hollywood and being a movie star was the ultimate. It was royalty. Maria focused all her energy on her delicate new baby. She frequently took Natasha to the movies and by age two, the toddler was a quiet and attentive film goer. They would have newsreels and they would have a camera that would sort of point toward the audience and Maria would whisper, Natasha, the, the cameras, they are on you. The ambitious Maria had decided her daughter would be a movie star. And when Natasha was four, her mother seized on a chance to launch her career. We were living in Santa Rosa, which is a town in Northern California, and a film company came on location and they just needed some little girl to drop an ice cream cone. Maria hauled her daughter to the set of the film Happy Land. Natasha charmed the director and won the bit part. She was barely seen in the movie. But within a year, Maria announced that the family was moving to Los Angeles to pursue Natasha's acting career. The six-year-old was terrified. She was made to feel that if she did not do a good job, not just her life and her career would be ruined, but somehow her parents, her whole family would fall apart. After eight months of rejection, Natasha got a chance to read for the role of an orphan in the drama Tomorrow Is Forever, starring Orson Welles. Her character was required to cry on cue. Maria had brought with her a butterfly in a glass jar. And knowing that Natalie was such a sensitive child, tore the wings off the butterfly in front of Natasha, who cried as if it were coming from the very depths of her soul. Natasha's tear-filled screen test won her the part for which her hair was dyed blonde. With coaching from her mother, Natasha became the perfect professional. Polite, smart, and above all, obedient. I couldn't read, of course. Um, I was only in kindergarten. Uh, so the lines were read to me, and I, I learned them, you know, just from hearing them. International Pictures offered its new discovery a seven-year contract. But young Natasha Gurdon was irritated to learn she would have to take on a more American-sounding name, Natalie Wood. Natasha was appalled at the idea, and she thought that was not very pleasant to the year and certainly didn't conjure up a pretty image, I think is the way she put it. Although she was unhappy, Natalie did her best to accept the change. It was what I was told to do, and I did as I was told, and I was kind of a dutiful child. After the success of Tomorrow Is Forever, one of Hollywood's biggest studios, 20th Century Fox, hired the gifted newcomer for a modest holiday-themed comedy called It's Only Human. The film was eventually renamed Miracle on 34th Street. Well, young lady, what's your name? Susan Walker, what's yours? Mine? Chris Kringle. I'm Santa Claus. Starring opposite Maureen O'Hara. Mr. Gailey. John Payne. I think I'd better get the meat. And Edmund Gwynn. <laughs> Natalie played a jaded young New Yorker who learns to believe in Santa Claus. He's much better than last year's. At least this one doesn't wear glasses. She knew what she was supposed to do before anybody told her. 
She was that good. That's what I want for Christmas. You mean a doll's house like this? No, a real house. If you're really Santa Claus, you can get it for me. And if you can't, you're only a nice man with a white beard, like Mother said. Now, wait a minute, Susie. Just because every child can't get his wish, that doesn't mean there isn't a Santa Claus. That's what I thought you'd say. Natalie may have been a professional actress, but she was also an innocent eight-year-old who still believed in Saint Nick. Edmund Gwen, I was nearly going to say Santa Claus, Natalie just adored him and was convinced he was Santa Claus. He was jolly and kind and wonderful. Natalie also felt close to her on-screen mother, Maureen O'Hara, especially during the long hours of filming at night inside Macy's department store. Natalie and I had a wonderful time because we'd sneak off and with nobody in the store, we were able to go through every department in the store and try on all sorts of things that we had no right to do whatsoever, but we really enjoyed it. It was wonderful. Miracle on 34th Street became a surprise smash. At the age of nine, Natalie Wood was a movie star. Her mother was ecstatic, but Natalie was confused. While working on Miracle, she'd been given two other assignments that overlapped. In The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, starring Rex Harrison and Jean Tierney, Natalie played a turn-of-the-century English girl. Mr. Scroggin says I'll always be here, and all the captains of all the ships will look at me through spy glasses. At the same time, she also played a smart-alecky farm kid in the comedy Scudda Who, Scudda Hey. Look, Pop, even his ears get red when he blushes. Why aren't you in school? Because it ain't time yet. She would go back and forth from set to set and is being called all these different names using different accents. Come on, Belinda, give. Mommy's coming aboard in a motor car. But I've got a feeling he is Santa Claus, Mother. Still wasn't quite accustomed to being Natalie. You quit calling by that dumb name, you hear me? You quit it! It was a battle for her to sort of reconcile these two names and these two competing personas. In 1947, Maria was thrilled to sign a seven-year deal for her daughter with 20th Century Fox. The nine-year-old now earned $800 a week, supporting a family that included her new baby sister, Lana. She loved the attention. She loved the adulation. She loved the feeling of some kind of power. She had an extraordinary power position in her family. She was the one. Natalie next starred in the drama The Green Promise, but during filming, she was petrified when a specially rigged bridge over a raging water set collapsed too soon. Natalie broke her wrist and almost drowned, but her mother refused to take her to the doctor. She was very concerned that Natalie wouldn't be thought of as a problem actress who had to be fussed over more than anyone else. The fracture left a large bump on Natalie's wrist that she tried to keep hidden by wearing bracelets for the rest of her life. The incident also fueled another lifelong fixation for Natalie. Well, I've always been terrified, still am, of, uh, of, of water, dark water, sea water, or, you know, river water. She was not just afraid of the water, she was phobic. She had dreams that she was going to drown. She really believed this would happen. Natalie's fears were compounded by frustration. At age 11, she was miserable when she was cast as an eight-year-old in the jackpot opposite Jimmy Stewart. Don't joke, Father. Children are the real victims of broken homes. I read an article in the Ladies' Home Journal that said, children are the real victims of broken homes, children are. That article sort of repeats itself, doesn't it? That got old very fast. She really did not want to be thought of as a child anymore, and she didn't want to play those roles anymore. As Natalie Wood moved into her teens, she was happy to be cast in parts closer to her age. At 13, she played Betty Davis's daughter in the 1952 drama, The Star. I got a lot of good training, because I was, I was very often the daughter of very famous actors, you know, and so I got a chance to work with them and have sort of a on the job, on the spot training, as it were, instead of going to an acting school. During production, the eager to please teenager learned a valuable lesson from the Hollywood veteran. Natalie had to swim in the film, but she was terrified at the prospect. Davis demanded that the director use a stunt double. Natalie became aware that when you were 
more important in the industry, you also had a louder voice and you didn't always have to do the thing that pleased everyone. Within a year, Natalie was blossoming into a beautiful Hollywood starlet. But after a decade in front of the cameras, the 14-year-old wanted more freedom, and she asked to be allowed to attend public high school. She decided that it was unnatural for her to not be with other children her age. She very much wanted to belong so that she could have something approaching a normal childhood. The rebellious teen started smoking and dating. She bought a Thunderbird convertible, and she began challenging her mother's authority. There were a lot of yelling matches. She had been so overly taken care of in her life, and she needed to go out on her own and make some mistakes. Natalie made a deal with her mother. She could do as she liked, as long as it didn't threaten her career. But by now, the vivacious beauty had outgrown roles for children, and movie offers had stopped. Natalie did find work in television, but like many in Hollywood, she felt the fledgling new medium was a step down. In 1953, Natalie starred in the short-lived CBS drama, Pride of the Family. She then appeared on the live anthology series, General Electric Theater, opposite an intense 23-year-old named James Dean. He had somewhat disparagingly said to her, well, so you're a child actress. And she said, well, it's better than acting like a child. And from that point on, she was OK with Jimmy. Don't talk. Well, i got to tell you this, don't talk. Story. Anybody can open his mouth and let words come out. Talk is so cheap, so awfully cheap. Well, I know that, but this is something that you can't and that was going to be the first time I was ever kissed, you know, when I was 15 and all that. And I was very excited. She just worshipped him. Oh, Lucy, Lucy. I, I know what you want to tell me. He was sort of held as this epitome of uh, an actor. Natalie learned that Dean's next project was a movie called Rebel Without a Cause. Its lead female character was an alienated, thrill-seeking teen desperate for love. The actress knew it was the perfect part for her. I became sort of rebellious at that age, and I, and I really fell in love with that part and wanted to do it very badly, and got into a big fight with my parents because they didn't want me to do it because the, the picture was sort of against parents and all of that. So I threatened to run away from home and become an actual juvenile delinquent unless I was given the chance to test for the part. Natalie begged director Nicholas Ray to hire her, but he'd already cast serious young method actors like Dennis Hopper and wouldn't commit to the former child star. Waiting anxiously for a decision, the underage actress often went carousing with Hopper. But one night, Dennis totaled her T-bird in a crash, and Natalie suffered a concussion. They were taken to the hospital, and Natalie asked that the first person to be called be Nick Ray, the director, not her parents. She told him, yeah, they called me a damn juvenile delinquent, Nick. Now do I get the part? Oh, but I can be a femme fatale, too. Why, in Rebel Without a Cause, I play a very bad girl. And if what Mr. Jack Warner tells me is correct, and I'm sure it is, we're going to be seeing a lot of you. But thank you, Gig. Girls don't love their father. Since when? Since I got to be 16? Stop that! On the very last day of filming, Nick Ray realized that he didn't ever have a close-up of James Dean and myself in the love scene, in which I'd say, you know, Jimmy, I, I love you. And the welfare worker came over and said, oh, no, time's up. You know, uh, Natalie, she can't work anymore today. So my mother took this fellow aside, and she had put a amount of, amount of money in an envelope, and she said, well, Natalie has got her schooling in now, hasn't she? I love you, Jim. I really mean it. Natalie was ecstatic about what she felt was her first grown-up role, but her excitement was brief. Three days before Rebel Without a Cause opened, 
James Dean was killed in a car crash. Natalie was hysterical when James Dean died, devastated. She was in New York doing a television show, and uh, my mom was real concerned that she would even be able to complete the show because she was, she was so upset by it. Ironically, Dean's tragic death helped make Rebel Without a Cause an instant hit. The film also catapulted 17-year-old Natalie to a new level of fame. Because of that movie, they saw that she was not just a child actress anymore and she could become a teenage star. Rebel Without a Cause earned Wood her first Oscar nomination. And she continued to work with the best in the business. In 1956, Natalie played a small but key role in the A-list western The Searchers, starring John Wayne. Go, Martin, please! Stand aside, Martin. No, you don't, Ethan. Ethan, no, you don't! Warner Brothers executives, eager to capitalize on Natalie's appeal, gave her a seven-year contract. Would hope to play strong, dramatic roles, but instead, she was relegated to lightweight fluff opposite Warner's latest teen heartthrob, Tab Hunter. There was a battle going on all her life between the desire to be a star, the need to be a star, the desperate need to be a star, uh, and the need and desire to be good. Bored with her work, Natalie threw herself into the off-screen role of a celebrity party girl. She was linked with high-profile boyfriends like Elvis Presley. But then in 1956, on her 18th birthday, she went on a date with a dashing 26-year-old actor named Robert Wagner. RJ, as he was known to his friends, was a rising star who had appeared in such films as Titanic and Prince Valiant. Wagner had also been the object of Natalie's girlish fantasies since she first saw him on the 20th Century Fox lot at age 11. Natalie liked intelligence and warmth and a gentleness. I think that's what she responded to more than anything. Natalie was in love, and one year after first dating Wagner, she was thrilled to discover an engagement ring and a glass of champagne. The glamorous couple married just three weeks later. They were just very good together. They were just very compatible. And um, they had great times. They had fun together. Finally escaping her mother's control, Natalie set out to recreate her life, and the press followed her every move. I don't think a day went by or a week went by that you didn't read something in the papers about them. Uh, they were a definitive Hollywood couple. <laughs> But behind her smiles for the camera, Natalie remained frustrated with her film career. Her next movie, the drama Marjorie Morningstar, was a flop, and Wood struggled over her identity as both an actress and an individual. I had worked so much, you know, since I was a child, uh, all during my childhood, that really by the time I was sort of 20 or 21, I wasn't, I didn't really have a very clear perception of myself. You know, I was always, I was Betty Davis's daughter or Maureen O'Hara's daughter or Jimmy Stewart's daughter or something like that. But I mean, you know, I, I was sort of uh, discombobulated. Natalie's frustration grew when Warner Brothers, hungry to cash in on Wood and Wagner's fame, cast the couple in a project she hated all the fine young cannibals. I see a cat come up out of the Texas jungle. This is that cat breaking loose now. The turbulent tempo of a hot trumpet. Barbaric music of youth restlessly searching for love. Couldn't stop myself. Chad, don't punish me. Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner in their first picture together. These are not kids. They're young adults. Ready to destroy each other in their search for love. If I can't have you, then I want to hurt you. And I will. I can't leave him. Why? He thinks it's his child. When All the Fine Young Cannibals was released, it was savaged by critics and rejected by audiences. Still feeling pressure from herself and her mother to succeed in Hollywood, Natalie began to worry that her chances as an actress were running out. This is a love story about a boy and a girl deeply, unredeemably, gloriously, and hopelessly in love. In 1960, 22-year-old Natalie Wood was cast in the drama Splendor in the Grass. 
she starred as a high school girl torn between family and her sexual attraction to a rich boy, played by Warren Beatty in his feature film debut. Splendor was very close to her emotional home. There was the very sort of odd mother-daughter relationship in the film that rang true to Natalie. Tell me the truth, Wilma Dean. No, Mom, we haven't gone too far. There was the pressure of, do you remain a child, do you grow up? Natalie was proud when her performance in Splendor in the Grass earned her a second Oscar nomination. That same year, director Robert Wise was looking for a leading lady to star in his film of the Tony Award-winning musical West Side Story, a modern retelling of Romeo and Juliet. But Natalie was not on his list. We were thinking of Warren Beatty as a possibility for the boy. So we went over to see Spider of the Grass. We forgot him immediately and said, there's our Maria right there. What in the world happened to us? We didn't think about her. And we forgot all about Warren for Tony and went right for her. Natalie received a career-high payday of $250,000. But as filming began, she quickly felt out of her league. She was a perfectionist in her work and in her life. She was very insecure about playing Puerto Rican, about singing and dancing when she was neither a professional singer nor a professional dancer. West Side Story's demanding score was a challenge to professional singers and impossible for an amateur to master. While she was on the set singing her heart out, some of the other actors and dancers would be ribbing each other off stage saying, oh, can you believe her voice? Natalie felt very pressured. We even rigged a little thing where she could call in sick, so to speak, and leave the set. I mean, it was terrible. I was supposed to distract the doctor. She had a thermometer. She was going to put it in soap, which someone said would raise her temperature. Natalie was crushed during production when she learned that her singing voice would be replaced by that of professional vocalist Marnie Nixon. She really did not have the range to do that. And it was a, a very bitter disappointment for her. History making is the word for the motion picture critics have acclaimed as a masterpiece. This records and winning 10 Academy Awards. It was little comfort for Natalie, who wasn't even nominated. But the actress had bigger problems. Her marriage was coming apart. There was nothing wrong with the other person as far as we were concerned, but there was a lot wrong with ourselves that needed to be sorted out. The couple's relationship became increasingly strained, and after one final argument, Natalie left RJ. She was heartbroken by the separation and their eventual divorce. Three months later, Natalie began dating Warren Beatty. Some speculated that the young Lothario was responsible for the breakup. That makes a good story in print. Their marriage did not end because Warren Beatty came along. Beatty and Wood often argued, but the passionate relationship helped Natalie recover from the pain of her broken marriage. Warren has this ability to make you feel like you are the only person in the room at that time. He made Natalie feel very important. The 24-year-old divorcee also started choosing roles that fit her new, more worldly outlook on life. In 1962, Natalie starred in Gypsy with Rosalind Russell. Wood played real-life stripper Gypsy Rose Lee, who struggled to escape the control of her domineering stage mother. There's another character that was very close to her, very close to who Natalie was. Gypsy, this is the big bouncy one about the darling of the runways who made herself a reputation. Starring Rosalind Russell, Natalie Wood, the Hollywood Blondes, and the most mama any girl ever had. I'm moving, maybe up, maybe down, but wherever it is, I'm enjoying it. I'm having the time of my life, because for the first time, it is my life. In Gypsy, Natalie finally got to sing. Let me. entertain you. I thought she sounded fabulous and told her so and she got this wonderful smile on her face and said that she was very pleased with what she had done on that. A real good time. 
Natalie was also excited to earn her third Academy Award nomination for the drama Love with the Proper Stranger. Natalie Wood and Steve McQueen, searching for the time, the place, and the proper stranger. Natalie starred as a salesgirl who gets pregnant by and then falls in love with a musician, played by Steve McQueen. Hi. Come uh, on in. Hi. Man, do you look wild. Thank you. Natalie was much better when she was with a good actor. She's tremendous in that movie. She had no training at that time. She just had instinct and a really fine actor to work off of and a lot of emotion. Get out! Go! I mean it! Go! Go where the wind blows you! Hey! Hey, come on, Angie. Let me in, will you? But after two strong dramatic performances, the actress struggled when she turned to comedy. Her work in films like Sex and the Single Girl and The Great Race was poorly received by critics. Natalie was also stung when she was named the worst actress of the year by the Harvard Lampoon. But the star once again put on a good face in public, accepting the dubious honor in person. After more than two decades of acting and over 35 film roles, Natalie had mastered the art of hiding her true feelings. But as her movies continued to fail critically and often commercially, not even Wood's closest confidants realized that her emotions were in turmoil and that the actress was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. By 1966, Natalie Wood's fiery romance with Warren Beatty had burned out. Now she dated millionaires like Arthur Lowe Jr., movie stars like Michael Caine, and a young actor named Henry Jaglum, who encouraged her to shake off her celebrity persona. She called it putting on the badge. I said, I love you around the house. You're this easygoing, communicative, warm, open person. And then as soon as we get to these parties or these events, you become, and she said, Natalie Wood. I said, oh, she said, that's the badge. So I said, so that's not you. She said, no, I'm Natasha Gordon. Natalie's private and public images were becoming harder to reconcile, and finally the pressure was too much. In November of 1966, the 28-year-old took an overdose of sleeping pills and was rushed to the hospital. I don't to this day know what tipped her over, but it wasn't partying, it was a deep pain. I think she just was trying to break out of something that was like a golden trap, so attractive, so seductive that you just don't want to leave it and yet you know enough to know that it, you have to push your way out. Thanks to a combination of daily therapy and determination, Natalie pulled out of her depression. She started to reclaim her life by breaking with her past. Wood paid Warner Brothers $175,000 to get out of her contract. Then she fired her staff of agents, managers, and lawyers. Natalie realized that what she wanted more than a big salary or even a great role was a family of her own. She desperately wanted children. She desperately wanted to raise them in a way that she was not raised. Natalie began seeing a charming English talent agent named Richard Gregson. She made up her mind that her career would not disrupt this relationship. She spent a lot of time in London, where Gregson had a home. She played with the children that he had from his previous marriage. And I think it was a healing for Natalie. In 1969, Natalie and Richard Gregson were married in a lavish Russian Orthodox ceremony. Now 30, Wood hadn't acted in two years. The decade of the swinging 60s, a time of cultural revolution, was at its peak. Eager to prove she was still relevant, Natalie played a suburban housewife turned sexual swinger in Paul Mazursky's social satire, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. The film co-starred Robert Culp, Elliot Gould, and Diane Cannon. Although the movie was about sexual liberation, Natalie, a child of old Hollywood, refused to appear nude. Natalie said absolutely not. And there we were in this supremely sybaritic environment. The girls in their bras was the single element that was totally correct for the scene. The movie gave Wood her first hit in years. 
Natalie was pleased, but at the time, her career was no longer her number one concern. She was pregnant and overjoyed. In 1970, Natalie gave birth to a daughter, Natasha Gregson. She seemed so at peace. It was this wonderful serenity where you felt that she had been fulfilled. Natasha was the name that Natalie never released that was her real name. And I think through having this child, she felt that she could somehow have an opportunity to reclaim this childhood that she had lost. Natalie also hoped to mend her strained relationship with her mother and moved Maria into the house to help look after Natasha. But Natalie quickly realized it was a mistake. Well, my mother thought she had another star in the making. My mom couldn't wait. Natalie sent my mom packing in the middle of the day suitcase tears <laughs> running down her face calling me saying pick me up i'm walking through park natalie told me to leave natalie was committed to giving natasha a happy and normal childhood but months later wood's marriage suddenly collapsed when she discovered that her husband of two years was having an affair she gave me a call and she said I've thrown Richard out of the house. She literally had him banned from the property. He couldn't drive onto the driveway. Natalie just, she ended it at that. In 1971, 33-year-old Natalie Wood filed for divorce from her second husband, Richard Gregson. But a chance meeting would help heal her broken heart when Natalie reconnected with the man she left 11 years earlier, Robert Wagner. Remember that night? Yes, I do remember that night. People sort of cleared away out of the room. <laughs> we suddenly found ourselves looking at each other, which was uh, sensational. That time apart, those 11 years made us really realize how much we meant to each other, and fortunately, we found each other and got back together. He made her feel much more safe and secure. He was sort of like, the knight in shining armor, you know, who <laughs> came and saved us from who knows what could have happened. Much had changed since their first courtship. The 42-year-old Wagner was recently divorced and was a successful TV star, while Natalie's career had cooled. But the two had one thing in common. They wanted to give their relationship a second chance. In 1972, Natalie and RJ remarried aboard a friend's yacht when we fell in love the first time, that was really our first love, and uh, you don't lose that. Natalie finally had the happy home life she craved. Besides her child, Natasha, she now had Robert Wagner's daughter from a previous marriage, Kate, to look after. Right away, I knew she was special. She was so warm and so friendly. And I remember Natasha was about 18 months old and in her crib, and clearly right away, it was obvious that she was the apple of her mother's eye. I would say that this time, uh, their family and their home meant more to them than their careers. And they were very dedicated to, to having a happy family and, and family life. In 1974, Natalie gave birth to another daughter, Courtney Brooke Wagner. The children were always her first priority. When Courtney came along, I think that kind of made it all come together. For Christmas time or Thanksgiving, it was always a big deal. I mean, that, that actually was extravagant and was a big deal. They'd have Santa coming to the house. And lots of kids were around. While maintaining a happy home for her children, Natalie also made sure to spend time alone with her husband. She and RJ often cruised on their yacht, The Splendor, named after one of the films Natalie was proudest of, Splendor in the Grass. Her fear of water wasn't a factor when she was on the ship. The boat was in the water. She wasn't, so it was all right. But it was also, the boat was a wonderful escape for her, you know, where she could literally leave the telephone and uh, the, uh, the pressures behind. As long as she wasn't swimming, she was fine. What's your name? Saka. It'll have to do, I suppose. As much as she loved being a wife and mother, Natalie liked to work. In 1975, she went back in front of the cameras, starring as a sexy femme fatale in the film noir spoof Peeper, opposite former boyfriend Michael Caine. But after years away from acting, Natalie was uncomfortable on the set. 
and it showed. I had this feeling that you were Ellen Prendergast, but it was only a hunch. Do I know you, Tucker, or just your type? I'll tell you a secret. Must you? My goodness, a concealed weapon. It's a terrible burden on me. We must all bear our crosses. Slammed by critics, the film quickly vanished. The fact that Peeper wasn't a huge success was a, a signal to her that she no longer had the stature that she had once in Hollywood. Now in her mid-30s, Natalie was rarely considered for plum film roles. To increase her visibility, the actress turned to television and won good notices in several high-profile projects. Wood enjoyed working with her husband in the NBC production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. She appeared in a miniseries remake of From Here to Eternity. She also proved she could do more than act by starring in and producing the TV movie The Cracker Factory. But in 1979, Robert Wagner became the family's bona fide TV star. His new series, Heart to Heart, was a smash hit, and Natalie couldn't help but feel overshadowed. There was a part of her that felt lost without performing because it was something that was so, again, inculcated in her that she felt incomplete. Natalie continued to seek out feature film roles, but her next attempt at a big screen comeback Meteor burned out fast at the box office. At age 42, Natalie was still lovely, but younger actresses like Diane Keaton and Meryl Streep now reigned in Hollywood. As the 1980s began, Natalie Wood was facing middle age, a tough time for any actress, but she had her children, her husband, and plans to revitalize her career. She had everything to live for. In 1981, 43-year-old Natalie Wood found a film role that she believed could restore her standing as a top Hollywood actress. Brainstorm was a character-driven science fiction drama co-starring Christopher Walken. But during filming in North Carolina, Natalie's anxious side resurfaced, and she worried about how old she looked opposite Walken, who was five years her junior. Wood was also uncomfortable with the chaotic, often improvised production. I don't think Natalie would ever improvised anything in her life. She was a star, uh, it needed to be on the page, and that's what she did. During a break in shooting, Natalie was delighted to return to her family in Los Angeles in time for Thanksgiving. She didn't look forward to the final weeks of filming, and to take her mind off work, she and Robert Wagner cruised to Catalina Island on the Splendor. Christopher Walken joined them, but the pleasure trip took an unexpected and unpleasant turn. From the time they set sail, there just seemed to be an underlying tension on the boat. There was also a, a huge amount of alcohol that was consumed. On the night of November 28, Natalie, RJ, and Christopher Walken had dinner and drinks at Doug's Harbor Reef, a restaurant on Catalina Island. During the evening, Natalie became increasingly intoxicated. It was a night of all kinds of emotions, these sort of frictions that would come and go, and at a certain point she smashed a glass against the, the wall. After dinner, the trio returned to the Splendor. As Robert Wagner later recalled, he and Walken engaged in a political debate while Natalie went off by herself. About an hour later, R.J. retired to his stateroom, where he expected to find his wife. She wasn't there, or anywhere else on the boat. Frantic with worry, Wagner radioed the Coast Guard, and a desperate search of the harbor began. The dinghy was discovered at early, early morning. Natalie was not with the dinghy. At 7.45 a.m., searchers finally found Natalie. They were too late. At the age of 43, Natalie Wood was dead. At first I thought they'd made a mistake. Oh, absolutely not. It's not her, it didn't happen, can't be. And then I think when reality hit, it was just everything became a blur. The coroner concluded that Natalie's death was accidental. Officials determined that she had fallen into the water while trying to retie the dinghy to the yacht. The actress's shocking death 
ignited a frenzy of morbid speculation and gossip in the media. But one horrible fact was beyond debate. Natalie Wood was gone, taken by the deep, dark water she had feared all her life. My mother never stopped weeping for Natalie, ever. That's when my mother's mental health began to decline. My mother was never the same. It's like a part of her was gone. It was just the worst thing that could have ever happened. And my dad did everything he could to try to make it as bearable as, as it could be. It was very difficult for all of us. And, uh, you know, every day is, every day is a little, a little better. Sometimes you go forward and sometimes you slip back. As Natalie's family and fans mourned, filmmakers struggled to complete the unfinished brainstorm. Two years would pass before the film was released. Reviews were generally poor, but many moviegoers were grateful to see a final glimpse of Natalie's radiant beauty. Like her last film, the life of Natalie Wood was incomplete. But the actress left behind a rich legacy of acclaimed movies and memorable performances. She also lives on in the hearts of her family, friends, and fans who never forgot the charming young girl who became a striking and generous woman. I love you, Jim. Natalie was a real sweetheart. She had a great, great talent. She was this very bright, very caring human being. Oh, she was wonderful. She was a great mother, and for the girls, she left a great deal. And she'll always be with them, I know. I think she would like to be remembered as a person who loved life, appreciated the arts, and lived life happily.